Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, several prominent French male journalists are suspended for taking part in a private Facebook group that allegedly encouraged online harassment of women. Also, how has feminism, Me Too and digital technology impacted the world of dating? We talk to British journalist and author Nikki Hodgson, who's written about relationships in the era of Tinder. And we meet the latest star recruit to Paris Saint-Germain, the Afghan Danish female footballer Nadia Nadim. But we begin here in Paris where several French media outlets have been rocked by allegations that a number of its male journalists were members of a private Facebook group that publicly harassed women reporters. The closed group called itself a League of LOL or Laugh Out Loud. It's also been described as a macho online boys club and is said to have spread pornographic memes online while doctoring images of its victims. Catherine Viette has more. A moment of reckoning for French media as allegations have come to light highlighting a culture of intimidation, trolling and cyberbullying online. The eye of the storm, the private Facebook group known as the League of LOL, Laugh Out Loud, made up predominantly of male journalists. Over the past decade, its members used social media to mock and harass mostly female journalists and bloggers. Dozens of victims have since come forward, all sharing stories of relentless online abuse. At the time, I wasn't necessarily able to bear it. I felt denigrated, and I lost a lot of confidence, too, in my ability to think, to work as a journalist. Prenons La Une, a group that advocates for gender equality in the media here in France, says women are disproportionately targeted by online trolls, and the impact is overwhelmingly negative. Women journalists are massive victims of cyberbullying. There's a survey by the International Federation of Journalists which shows that two-thirds have suffered cyber harassment. Half of the victims have been subjected to sexist insults. The closed group was set up by Vincent Glad in 2009. He's now apologized, saying he created a monster. The aim of the group wasn't to harass women, just to have a laugh. But our way of amusing ourselves quickly got out of hand, and we didn't realize. But victims of the online abuse say they don't want apologies. They want to see an end to the sexist boys club mentality. Do I forgive them? Not necessarily. They had 10 years to apologize. Started in 2009, and now it's 2019. They had 10 years and only apologized a few days ago. In a country that so far has had an uneasy relationship with the Me Too movement, the revelations have sent shockwaves through the insular male-dominated industry. I think that until now the media world was protected, not because it didn't exist, but because it didn't come out. There was no reason why the media world should be spared from this type of behavior, which is macho behavior. Glad and several other journalists involved in the group have either been suspended from their jobs or disciplined. The Laugh Out Loud League has been denounced by France's gender equality minister and called a group of losers by the Minister for Digital Affairs. Now, February, thanks to Valentine's Day, is the month where we celebrate love. But how much has the Me Too era affected the world of dating these days? And are we still sticking to those same stereotypes when it's up to the, the men to pursue women? Or does being a feminist well and truly hinder your chances when it comes to dating? Nikki Hodgson is a British journalist who's written a book appropriately entitled The Curious History of Dating from Jane Austen to Tinder. Nikki, thank you so much for being with us. Digital thank technology you. has turned the world of dating upside down, but has it had a destructive influence? Well, if you talk anecdotally to people, they certainly seem to be struggling to find long-term love. But at the same time, dating apps have never been more popular. Uh, the industry is worth billions of pounds now internationally and uh, you know it's kind of impossible to believe that Tinder only burst onto the scenes five years ago. It's really changed the way that we meet and couple up permanently. But dating apps have a tendency of turning people into commodities don't they? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So I've consulted for a few dating apps and what I found is that to some extent they were rather like the diet industry, not the positive health and wellness industry that we're seeing emerge out of that, but the old fashioned diet industry where they give you a promise of something they're going to deliver for you. And as long as you stick with their programme, you might see short term results. But long lasting results are very hard to come by. And more importantly, they don't want long lasting results from you because then they lose you as a customer. So I think bearing that in mind, you've got to understand that when you're using one of these apps, uh, the house is, is set up to win and your chances of finding love are actually quite remote. But there are some things you can do to circumvent the situation, the, the tricks that they try to use to lure you into reusing the app, even when you found somebody that you might really like dating. And uh, if you employ those and you can definitely have success. I actually met my fiance on an app, so I wouldn't say that they're absolutely a waste of time. Now, you have argued that being a feminist is far from being a hindrance when women date. Yeah, I mean, increasingly so, we see women being able to have a far greater range of relationship choices ahead of them. So we know that marriage rates are down in the Western world, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. People are still coupling up, but they're having children at different ages, ages that suit them, where they can accommodate a career as well as child raising. And, uh, you know, they have greater options in terms of the kinds of relationships they can have, casual relationships, mixed race relationships, all these things are on the up. And these are all good things for women because, you know, traditionally, it's kind of almost impossible to remember, but in fairly recent history, women really were curtailed according to their relationship choices. And uh, what I discovered in writing the book throughout history is that when women's rights change, their legal rights, then their dating options increase. So what you're saying is that digital technology, and particularly dating apps, have actually empowered women. I think so, yes, because there are so many more options available to people in the kinds of people they can date than ever before. And we're not expected to just get married by the age of 21 and get on with having children anymore. And dating apps fully accept that. They fully accept women's autonomy. The problem is that men, as always in these situations, tend to fall a little bit behind and it takes them a few years to do some catching up when they have to get to grips with the fact that women have moved on, they want different things out of their relationships and, you know, they need to keep up to speed in order to satisfy them. So with that in mind, how has the Me Too campaign changed the world of dating? Well, I think the Me, the Me Too campaign has really had an inestimable positive effect on dating. You know, we hear so much in the press about men feeling afraid to flirt and not knowing the best way to approach someone anymore as a result of it. But it was high time that men had to reassess how they went about flirting with people. And uh, if that encourages some more reflection and some better manners on the part of men, then that's all for the good. And I think it's definitely increased women's sense of self-worth what kind of behaviour they should tolerate and what they shouldn't, and the right to that behaviour. So when you look back at history, Nikki, was there ever a golden era in dating? <laughs> That's a really good question. I think actually the Regency period in England uh, was a very good time to date because that was when people started to use personal adverts to contact one another actually far earlier than we would presume. And what was so good about it is that the Regency ladies and gentlemen dating used very frank messaging to indicate what they were willing to tolerate in a relationship. And they would state how much money they needed a year to live on and where they would like to live and then they took it from there. And what I took from learning about that period was that the more direct you are about what you want, the better your chances of getting it in the long term, which is really the at odds with how we are dating today. You know, we hide our feelings, we hide our needs, we hide our wants, and that is partly why we're not having so much success anymore. So we should be taking lessons from Mr Darcy and Elizabeth Bennett. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I think so. Nikki Hodgson, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, meet Paris Saint-Germain's latest star recruit, Nadia Nadim, an Afghan refugee who, after moving to Denmark, went on to become a star female footballer, including a stint at Manchester City. And we're not on the field now for the top French club. The soccer star is in the final days of her medical degree. A day of training for Nadia Nadim. The Danish player joins her teammates. After her recent move to Paris, she already feels at home. 
It's it's awesome. It's great. Uh, obviously, a dream come true. Um, it's it's been good, and uh, the football is great. Um, I'm enjoying playing here and enjoying myself. Nadia Nadim could not have imagined reaching this point in her football career when she was younger. She was born in Afghanistan, where football is strictly forbidden by the Taliban. Her father allowed her to play in secret. He introduced us to football. He gave us our first football, but um, we used to play um, in our backyard. He was killed by the Taliban when they gained power in the country. Um, and yeah, that's where we, my mom um, and my four other sisters, decided to leave the country um, and go somewhere where we could have a future. After a trying journey, Nadia Nadim and her family arrived to a refugee camp in Denmark. She joined a local football club and was immediately noticed, thanks to her extraordinary talent, by the man that would become her mentor. She was many, many levels uh, better than the, the other players. You know, when you when you meet people like that, you are not in doubt that they, they're going to do great things. Nadia is now an icon in Denmark. She is the first foreigner to play with the national team. She goes over her journey in her autobiography in which she holds nothing back. She tells her story so naturally, incredible considering what she's gone through. She wants to share her story to show young female players that what they're doing is worthwhile. At 31 years old, the striker is already thinking about her retirement. Soon she will trade in her football jersey for scrubs. Becoming a surgeon is her next challenge which she is close to accomplishing. Only a few months of school left before changing her title to Dr. Nadim. Another impressive female. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.